in the beginning. Genesis has traditionally been viewed as a template for what life is supposed to be. In Genesis, we learn about the perfect God named Yahweh who created his good world and he blessed it. However, humanity broke the template. Therefore, Genesis does not include stories of heroes and perfect people. It contains stories of men and women who made choices against God's good intentions, and the result was brokenness and pain. Despite this, God did not give up on humanity, and he kept his plan to redeem his good world moving forward. So join us as we look at these stories of men and women and these stories of blessing, brokenness, and promise. As has already been stated by Rob this morning, we welcome you to our services here at Northeast. Thank you all for those of you who are here this morning in person, joining us in person, and for those of you who are joining us online, we encourage you to, if you have the opportunity and you're interested, come visit us in person sometime. Thank you for taking the time to join us online this morning. Uh, first thing I want to mention before I get into my lesson is uh, a couple wants to identify uh, Northeast as their home church, make it their home church. They've actually been attending here pretty regularly for several months. Many of you have already gotten a chance to meet them, but Marty and Becky Phillips, they are sitting right over there, and I'm going to ask them to stand. They are Courtney Lutz's parents. And so some of you have, like I said, have met them, but want to encourage you to welcome them to Northeast. So I don't see Clint this morning. Is Clint here? He's not feeling good. Well, it wasn't because your, your parents were going to be members there now, is it? Doesn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> That's just a joke, okay? <laughs> he loves his in-laws. I know that for a fact. Uh, Noah, Noah and I had a chance uh, to go down, I guess a couple of months ago, to visit with Marty and Becky and had a delightful visit with them. And I feel like they're going to have so much uh, to offer in terms of the, how they'll bless this church. And I hope and pray as well that the Northeast family will be a blessing to you. I think it's, uh, as Rob often says, it's great to be a Christian. I'm glad I'm a Christian and I'm glad I'm a Christian at Northeast. And I'm glad I'm here today. It's a special day. And it's not a special day because today's a Super Bowl. And I see Shane wearing his Kansas City <laughs> jersey. Man, you have some nerve, don't you, <laughs> dude? You just don't care about rubbing it in, do you? That's all right. That's all right. We'll have to talk a little bit about disfellowship pretty soon here. But it is special uh, because we're a part of God's family. We uh, believe that there is a God who created us. We believe uh, that we are not just the product of, of chance, the random formation of matter. And all of this uh, account at least from a spiritual and a theological standpoint, begins in the book of Genesis. And it is a book about blessings. It is a book that deals with brokenness, and it is a book about God's promises. And many of us uh, who are here this morning can speak in very realistic terms in our own lives about all of those realities in our lives. We can speak of brokenness personally, we can speak of the blessings we have in Jesus, and we can embrace the promises of God. And that is so, so important to understand that. And it's so important for us as we have this series and we're talking about life during these times and we're talking about origins and all of that. Let's not forget their, their story is our story. This morning we'll be talking about Adam and Eve and their story is my story. It's your story. And so the challenge for you and me as we go through this series or any series 
is to find ourselves in the story and find my place overall in the story of God. And a beginning point in that is understanding the importance of how I approach life and how I view what goes on and all those important key questions of life such as, who am I? Why am I here? I mean, do, do, I, do I even have a purpose? Where am I headed? Is there something better? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Is there a spiritual reality beyond what we just see in the physical universe? Are we just physical matter? Are we just flesh and blood? Did all of this that has happened, is it just the result of the random force of matter spontaneously creating life from non-life? And then if you believe that is the case, then you have to believe that whatever that simplest thing that was formed by accident grew over time and learned to reproduce itself and then became what we know as the world in creation today. Now, I believe in the fact that we live with a purpose and that we are going somewhere and that what is right and wrong and meaningful is not just determined by the majority of how people feel or enforced upon others because might makes right, but because there is an entity within all of us. And that entity is something that is tied to a creator God who created us in his image. Noah talked about that last week. And there is so, so much richness and depth in this idea, this concept of believing that I am not just some physical substance. That being created in his image means that he created me and he created our original parents in a way that he could relate to them and they could understand him and he could communicate with them. And so being created in the image of God is not just some unimportant side thing that we discuss theologically. It speaks to the very heart and core of who you are. That you are not just an animal and we don't just live by the law of the jungle. That God created you and me with a conscience and a sense of ought. And we'll talk about that in a minute as we get into the text. But we've been created in relationship. And it's not because of anything that is contrary to the purpose and nature and will of God. Because even before mankind was created, there was relationship within the Godhead. And so to be created in the image of God is to be created in relationship because even before human beings were created, there was a relationship within deity itself. You see it in the book of Genesis here is the conversation goes on within the Godhead about let us create man in our image and he created man in his image, woman in his image. Reflecting who he is. And so when God says it's not good that man should be alone, I'll create a helper suitable for him, he's speaking to something that already existed within that relationship. There was relationship before the creation of human beings. I'm not going to get into it this morning. No, you should have just covered this all thoroughly last week, okay? What? Why did, why, why did God create us in the first place? Why, why did God create? There's, there's a poet that wrote songs and, and had poetry, a Christian man named James Johnson, 
who wrote a poem in the early 1900s. And in this poem it says, And God stepped out on space and he looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'm lonely. I'll make a world. I don't believe that's why God created the world, the universe, us to relate to him and enjoy a fellowship with him. He wasn't lonely. There wasn't anything lacking. But, but what he did was consistent with his nature, a God who is love, a, lo- a God who is relational, a God who is giving. And so that's what Adam and Eve had. They had a perfect, a perfect environment. Go online and you can see some humorous punts and quips about Adam and Eve. I love this one. It says, Adam and Eve were the happiest and the luckiest couple in the world. And why is that? This person says, because neither one of them had a mother-in-law. Now, that's terrible. I know what y'all are thinking. <laughs> I already, I already came, you know, did an in-law joke with, with uh, Clint not being here. That was not planned, okay? That was me being dumb. everything. They had it all. I mean, they are, they are in this, this paradise, a piece of heaven on earth. Their needs are met. They've been blessed with each other. And there's something powerfully wonderful about this relationship that God has created in instituting this this beautiful relationship of marriage between a man and a wife. They had so much. They had work to do, and it, it wasn't work that was drudgery. It's not how you feel sometimes on Sunday night when you're dreading going into work in the morning and, uh, you know, there's this grind. It was work and it was fulfilling and it was joyous and meaningful. They had been invited, as Noah mentioned last week, into this partnership with God in the creation that he had brought about and to rule and have dominion over the world and be a part of this plan and this stewardship. They had each other. They were told to be fruitful and multiply. And God chose in this environment to appear to them in a way that they could relate to. I don't know exactly what he looked like, but he probably looked a lot like them. And he walked in the garden and talked with them and they conversed. And there was this shared relationship that was so special. They had it all. They had everything they needed. But we know what happens, don't we? I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. By the end of Genesis chapter 3, we find as a result of sin them being cast from the garden, losing so much, no longer having access to the tree of life, so ultimately death would fall upon them and fall upon others and fall upon us. And sometimes we think, you know, why in the world, how could that happen? Why did it happen? So the question is, well, why did God create in the first place? Here's another question for you. Why did God create human beings if he knew that they would choose the wrong way and they would suffer consequences for it or be punished or faces judgment. Did any of you ever think that? Raise your hand. <laughs> some, some of you have. I have. And I don't want to go into the full theological explanation of that right now, but I will say this, that when God made the decision to create human beings who could relate to him and have a choice, he was taking a risk. And I've said before on frequent occasions that if God had so chosen, he could have created us like robots 
and could have programmed us to be a certain way and do a certain thing and obey everything that he tells us to do. But God was willing to take a risk to have a relationship with something far beyond the animals, with the soul and a spirit that are a part of that innate nature that is linked to being created in the image of God. Knowing that if the choice was meaningful and if, if the choice was real, that we could make that choice and fall, right? The fact is, what does, what does love of somebody else mean if it's not reciprocal? Tim, what if the only reason you love Rhonda is because there was some program put into you to love her and to care for her? And Rhonda, that goes the same with you and Tim and everybody else in here who has a relationship with somebody else. Devotion to God and being faithful to God and loving God, it means nothing if, if we had no other choice than to do that. So God goes with this grand plan. And I believe the moment that God made the choice to create free will human beings who could choose him or not choose him, I believe at that exact instance, God in his foreknowledge knew what we would choose. Now, I don't necessarily believe he knew before he made the choice to create free will human beings because he's dealing with a real reality now. That choice has been made, and I believe at that moment he knew. I made that choice. But let's not think for a minute that God was taken by surprise. He was not taken by surprise about what we read here in Genesis chapter 3. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, and Paul there is talking about this grand plan of God and says, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then it says, He chose us before the creation of the world. Think about that a minute. He chose you. He chose us. He chose us before the creation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And so, even before the creation, even before the fall, God is working out a plan to bring us back to him. So we have a choice, they had a choice. Yes, indeed, God takes a risk, but he's not taken by surprise. And I know what some of you may be thinking. What were they thinking? How could they make such a terrible, terrible choice? How could they make such a choice? Well, they did. And maybe sometimes we think, well, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I would, if I'd have been there, you put me there in the garden, I'd never do that. How, how, many, how many of you, raise your hand really high, how many, how many of you, have never, ever looked back on a choice or a decision or something that you've done. Never, with a regret. You look back and you've always made the right decisions. All right, I know better than that. <laughs> We've all been there. And the fact is, the truth is, temptation is tempting. Now, write that down. That's such a profound, deep thought. <laughs> It's an easy point. Once again, you may be thinking, well, if I had been there, I wouldn't have done that. I had, all, I had the perfect environment. I'd never do that. 
Number one, I don't like apples. So let me let you in on a little secret. Even though I've heard some of us in class, teachers, students alike, talking about the temptation and talking about the apple. Come on, let's get this right. We don't know if it was an apple or not. It was fruit, okay? But whatever the case is, you, let's say it was an apple. I don't like apples. I, I, I wouldn't have done that. And secondly, and secondly, I don't like snakes. <laughs> so the moment, the moment, the moment I saw that snake in the garden, I would have been like Splitsville. I would have been gone. I wouldn't have messed with it. And there's a, there's a lot in this, this narrative that, you know, it leaves you with questions, some things you know, some things you don't know. When God later curses the, the serpent and says you're going to slither on your belly, it's like, what did he look like before that? Did he look different? And I don't know the answer to all these questions, but I do know this. When, when the devil is approaching Adam and Eve, they are not afraid of him. He's in an appearance that, that it, it doesn't threaten them. And there is a temptation to do what he initiates in his discussions with them. And the fact is, sin, going our own way, doing our own thing, with this regard for others, a lot of times that feels good. So whether it's the, 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 the high or sexual thrill, the enjoyment of hanging on to that resentment or bitterness. You know, somebody's hurt you and you're angry and Mm, you can just you can just feel it and you cling to that because it feels good. It really does. You think it does. But it's tempting. I think I told you before, growing up there was a boy who lived in our neighborhood, lived in the house behind us. He was about a year older than me, teased me all the time, nah, 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 all just stuff, and I felt scared and intimidated and I didn't like him. And one day at the community swimming pool when I was about 12 or 13 years old. Carl is going on and on. And I felt like Ralphie. You remember the scene in A Christmas Story when that kid had, uh, and Ralphie finally has had enough, if you remember that scene. And he lights into that kid and just pummels him. So I had had enough, and Carl is in the pool, and he's yang, yang, yang about something, and I just... Something in me. I hauled off and I hit that brace filled mouth <laughs> with my fist. And I remember at that time how satisfied I felt. But also at the same time how horrified I felt. But on some level, it felt really good. There's a promise of more and better. There's a promise of different. And so, at, at the core, at the heart, is it, we're kind of examining what's going on here. There is, there is this key important question. It applied to them, it applies to us. Can God be trusted? And you see what the devil in the form of a serpent, whatever that looked like, is saying to them and how this process goes. It begins with a discussion. It begins with a conversation. It seems a little bit innocent. But the deception is pulling them in a direction that they don't want to go. Did God really say you can't eat any of this fruit? Any of this food? All of it? You can't eat any of it? Well, no, we can eat. We can eat everything except this tree in the middle of the garden. Notice the devil does not approach them with, man, look at everything that you have. Isn't this wonderful? This is amazing. 
from the very start, we have been pulled in, into things in places we don't want to go because we think somehow it's going to be better or more fulfilling or it's going to make me happy. And maybe the affair feels good for a while and it's thrilling, but over time things fall apart and the marriage falls apart and all kinds of consequences. I give so many examples of this. And quite frankly, this is another key element of the whole story. And it's what, what we call the allure of the forbidden. There was something even then in them that this, this thought, if, if I can't have, you, you know, God does have something that I don't have, and I want to understand things better. And, and Satan's getting them to think, well, God doesn't have your best interest at heart. God doesn't have your back. God is holding back. He's not enough. He's not giving you enough. So, wow, if I could get that. When Andrew, our son, was, I don't know, two years old, two and a half years old, we had a mouse in the house. Hey, that runs. I could do a Dr. Seuss book, couldn't I? So we had a mouse in the house, and he was running all over the place, but mainly he was downstairs. And in the downstairs, we had a laundry room. It was not finished, but it was connected to everything else, but the mouse was getting around. But we discovered that he was mainly in the laundry room. So we, we put a mouse trap in the laundry room, put some peanut butter or cheese on, I don't remember everything we did, but we made sure to tell Andrew, you know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> Andrew, don't touch this. It will hurt you. This is not a toy. So tell us you're not going to touch it, all right? That we're trying to get the mouse, and we go in on and on and on. A couple of days go by. He runs past us red-faced into his room, crying. And we go in there and ask him what's going on. And he says, oh, I didn't know it would bite me. <laughs> we told you. We warned you. But there was just that, oh... And looking back, don't use that approach with your kids in the future, by the way, because as soon as you make a big deal about something, but you know how, how we are, how they are, how kids are, you tell them no, and you want it because you tell them no, right? I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this. My time is almost up. But sin has consequences. In the day you eat of it, you will die. And he says, I was afraid, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So, we have reminders around us all the time. If you were to read on in this chapter, you will see that there is a curse. There is a curse upon the devil. We'll talk about that in a second. There is a, a curse upon the woman that her pain would increase in childbirth, that things in life are going to be more difficult. There will be a curse of the ground. The ground is cursed. And your labor and your work is going to be more difficult. So when you're working in your garden this spring or this summer and you're fighting the weeds, let that be a reminder to you of the consequences of sin and the price and difficulty of sin. And certainly we are reminded of the terrible consequences of that sin, that first sin, in the death we see all around us and everything that leads to that. And so, yes, we live in a beautiful world that God created, but the world is broken. And there are hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes. And we're free will beings that live in a social world, and so our choices sometimes hurt and harm others, and people are hurt, and crimes are committed, and people commit suicide. 
And there are all those consequences. I could spend more time talking about it. But to me, this is one, one of the key things in Genesis chapter 3. And that is, it's the end of innocence. You know, when your kids are little, they're, you know, one, two years old, they're running around, they're, they're naked, they're, they're getting in the bathtub. We all think it's cute. Some of you probably have pictures of your kids and they're cute little pictures, you know. Um, but that, that changes, doesn't it? And I, I, think of, I think of Adam and Eve and who, where they were and who they were. They were in this, there was, there was no shame, there was no guilt, there was this, this freedom in this experience in this beautiful setting. And then they're hiding. And they're running. And there is this end of innocence and yes, they eventually died a physical death. And yes, you and I face physical death because we are sons and daughters of Adam, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam all die. But it also says in Christ shall all be made alive. The end of innocence. I've shared with you before the feelings I sometimes get when... I see those videos or those pictures of my kids or even my grandkids when they're young and they're so sweet and they're so innocent. And do you ever do that when you're looking at those videos or looking at those pictures and you're thinking, oh, you know, you, you, get, you get it? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, how sweet. And then they had to grow up and face this world. And, and this, this knowledge, this knowledge around them and what they see and the carnal knowledge and all that stuff. Living in an age and a culture that's just pushing, pushing children away so quickly from this innocence. There was nothing magical in that fruit. I, I, I firmly believe that there was not like some secret potion in that fruit that did something to their mind or psyche. It was already there. And what was already there was a sense of ought, a sense of conscience that was a part of being created in the image of God. And when God said, who told you you were naked? He knew the answer to that question. They didn't have to be told. There was this shame and this guilt that came rightly so because they had violated the will of God and they knew that something was drastically wrong. I wish I had more time to talk about this this morning, but I get out, you know, I get out of practice preaching and, you know, I was always so good about finishing right at 30 minutes when I was preaching all the time. I know lions of sin. That was a joke, not a lie. <laughs> we do the same thing. And so I just simply ask you this morning, as you look at the story, the sad, pitiful story, so where are you playing hide and seek in your life, in your relationships with God? I read an article this week that said the average person has 13 secrets that they keep, and five of those they've never told anybody. So I don't know what you may be struggling with, where you may be hurting. You're struggling in your marriage, and you somehow, somehow think everybody at church, they have it all together. I can't talk to anybody about these issues or problems, look, we've all been affected. There is not a family here that has not been affected by the consequences, the stain of what it means to have that image of God marred in our lives. But I encourage you to come clean, to seek help. Whatever it is you're dealing with, and that doesn't mean go tell everybody. Find people you can trust, you can talk to, who can help you and encourage you. 
And the neat thing here is in this story, I'll go quickly, God brings a curse, but he also provides a cure because later in this chapter, you see God doing what a mama does for her little child when it's cold outside and they don't want their child to get cold. God says, I don't know if he killed an, killed an animal. I don't want to get off on a tangent here. But in my mind, I think, how did he do this? Did he just poof? Ah, here's some garments. Or, or did God let them see him go out and take a dead animal and skin it and sew it together and lovingly say to them, look, Adam and Eve, these fig leaves, they, they're not going to get it. And there's certainly not going to be enough when you're out in this cold, hard, difficult world. God's providing garments for them. And in, in this brokenness, there's a promise that's a complete and final cure. This is my last point. In Genesis 3.15, there's a promise here. And God is speaking to the devil. And he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And ever since that time, there has been a constant battle, a constant fight. Chaos, conflict between Satan and his host and the human race. And yet in this place, and I know some people don't necessarily believe this is a prophecy about Jesus. I do. And it says, he will crush your head. This is God speaking to the devil, saying to him, he'll crush your head and you will strike his heel. And I believe this is a view to the future. I believe it's a view to the future of the cross. When as Jesus hung on that cross, God in the person of Jesus Christ, God and man, paying the price for our sin, taking the shame that we have and that we deserve, taking that guilt, that shame, himself on the cross. God says, I'll take it for you. In Jesus. And while Satan may have thought that he had won a great victory as Jesus hung on that cross and died, Satan was only striking his heel because in that act and his resurrection, Jesus crushed the head of Satan. Crushed it. And so, this brings me to the close. Your life doesn't have to be like this, this barrenness, this death. Your life can be like this right now in Jesus. And yes, we struggle. We still need his blood. We're still saved by his grace. But God is continually calling us to a fresh start, a new life. And he's saying beyond it, it, anything else, quit running from me. I love you, and I want you for myself, because that's who we need. Let us know if we can help you in any way. Last week, Virginia Wright made the decision to be baptized into Jesus. There may be some of you who are ready to make that commitment in that public, uh, in that public way. If we can help you, if you're struggling with anything in particular, contact us. We have contact information all over the place, so reach out to us. And as you sing this song, say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing me into the freedom and the life, even in this broken and dark world. God has better things in store for us, too. Okay, let's sing. Let's stand. We are so glad that you joined us today. This world is filled with brokenness, but there is always hope because our God is alive and present. If we can ever help you in your journey, please reach out to us. You can find out more information about the Northeast Church at www.northeastchurch.com.